Hello Internet and welcome back to the final language learning log for Japanese for the summer of 2021. If you don't know me already, my name is Mark. I'm a student at NYU studying computer science and linguistics. And if you're new here, this is the seventh language learning log where I've been tracking my progress of learning Japanese over the past three or so months. Every single learning log has kind of spent some time in the first half talking about some aspect of linguistics, whether it be phonology or, you know, some very basic overview of grammar. Uh, and then the second half has been just tracking my progress. And today's focus is going to be on what I would tell my past self starting Japanese three months ago. This is partially to, you know, for anyone who's been sticking along through the series or if you're learning to learn any language, these are some tips that might help you, but primarily it's a reflection period for me. So in writing the small script that I have over here for this video, it's been reflecting on what's worked for me, you know, what can I keep doing as I go forward, and what hasn't worked for me? What should I just throw away? Systems like these work differently for everybody, uh, and you know, anything you do will be tailored to you eventually. Try some things in this video if that's what you're looking for, if you're just here to relax chill, grab some water, make sure to hydrate. The theme of today is going to be past, present, and future self. I like to think of goals and working on things as past Mark sets aside some stuff for present Mark too. Yesterday I said Mark, you did to the language learning log on time. That's what tomorrow you is going to do. And uh, present me is doing that for future me. And future me is fluent in Japanese for five years down the road. Wavering levels of fluency. And yeah, so the recapping from the last time, the main focus this last two weeks has been learning the kanji for the JLPT N5 and reading through Take Kim's grammar guide. Uh, so I'll touch upon that with my progress. But before I get started on what I would tell myself and tips for learning kanji and other grammar things, I just want to quickly mention that I work at the NYU Child Language Lab and we are looking for participants for studies. You can check the pinned comment for more details, but if you know anyone or know anyone who has a child between the ages of two or nine. Pretty much we, we do some remote studies where they can play a game for 15 to 20 minutes. It's fun for them. It's fascinating for us. We just present little scenarios and we see how kids respond and see how they acquire language. Uh, if you'd like to know more, feel free to drop a comment or shoot me an email. I'd love to. And if you're in New York City, uh, we have some in-person studies as well. So just want to throw that out there because we are looking for participants. Anyway, if you have 30 extra seconds to reach out to somebody, uh, just check the pinned comment down below. We'd really appreciate it. So. Uh, today is going to be what I would tell myself when I started, some reflection on learning kanji, and general thoughts on immersion and my little pet theory about linguistics influence. So for context on this first thing, I did kind of two week sprints of Japanese learning. Each learning log was every other Saturday, and I set aside goals and said, okay, see what works for these two weeks, keep doing it, throw away something that doesn't work. And what I would tell myself is to spend the first two weeks doing just hiragana and katakana, which are Japanese's two uh, phonetic alphabet systems, uh, not including Romanji, of course. Now, the reason I say this is because A, it took me much longer to finally get them down. I was focusing on reading them and being able to write them, in other words, comprehend and produce, but they've become such a natural part of the learning process. In learning kanji, you have to learn how to pronounce the kanji and the five million pronunciations some of them might have, and you just kind of adapt hiragana and katakana to the learning process. So spend those first two weeks, or not even the first two weeks if you're really up for it, and just get those characters like 40% down because you will get the last 60% uh, within a month. The second piece of advice is to start a long-term kanji method and over the past week and a half, I've been using Wani Kani, which I'll talk about a lot in a couple minutes, but start kanji right away. You might as well just learn the associations of the readings. I did get a comment, it was deleted, so I'm not gonna show it, but it had some great tips. It was a few days after I found Wani Kani, and it, this, so the comment kind of certified, ooh, you know, I should use this. Uh, it takes around two to three years to complete the 2000 kanji and 6000 ish vocab. And so far it's been very helpful and it's been fun. I've been sitting down three to four times a day uh, to do those. and so. Just start doing this because it is something to get the ball rolling. Thing number three is to have different concrete goals so that you can vary yourself. You know, in the end, I want to become fluent in Japanese or at least conversationally comfortable. I have some light novels and manga right here. I open those up in a past learning log and that's kind of a more concrete goal to say, I wanna be able to read these in six months. Be able to go through and identify at least some of the kanji and some of the hiragana that might be uh, representing some grammar things. Make sure you have these milestones along the way. I, I kinda of said, just get as far as I can in three months. And that hindered me because it was not very clear. Obviously I knew I would not be 
nearly fluent. I can only say a few things and have a very basic understanding of putting sentences together. Thing number four is that kanji is more complicated than simply image word pronunciation. One kanji can have several different meanings. Here's one of my favorite examples, which also has several different sounds, onyomi and kunyomi. And as I've learned in Wanikani, these change depending on A, context, B, if it's the kanji or part of a vocab word, uh, so on and so forth. So that's kind of why I say start a long-term kanji method, and I wish I had started that right off the bat. I didn't know how to pronounce hiragana katakana at the time, but yeah, there's a lot more going on. You'll see a lot more of that when uh, we get to my progress clips and my recap of me learning the 103 JLPT N5 kanji over the last two weeks. Tip five is keep up with listening to things and change even more to Japanese. 95% of the music I've been listening to over the past two months has been Japanese music, and it's kind of a bop. Two things jump out at me for doing this. One, you slowly have to get used to the sound of a language. We hear things differently. There are different sound inventories. I talk about it in this learning log on phonology. Two, you kind of note progress as you listen to the same things over and over again. For me, it was notably hearing uh, tabun, you know, knowing what that means. And also the titles of the songs are often in kanji. And sometimes I was like, ooh, hey, I recognize that one. That means rain. Hey, that one, that one means fish. And so over time, you slowly put together the, the names of the song. Six, uh, so to briefly overview my little pet theory here, I'm a linguistic student and learning about sound inventories and the syntax of languages from theta roles to diatransitive, intransitive, and transitive verbs. I believe that this has helped me understand and analyze more about languages. Obviously this is not tested. Don't you know take my word for this. This is simply this theory I've been testing. When I see Japanese grammar or a sentence, I can kind of fit it into this larger wealth of knowledge, so to speak. But it's nice to see a grammar rule and not have to memorize it as itself, but say, oh, this is how negation works for this type of word order or something like that. What I accidentally thought was I should replace immersion with this linguistics thing. Very quickly, I realized that that's not gonna work. Uh, you know, you need to listen, watch, and read your target language. That's not something I really never believed, but it's not that I should be replacing, do 50% immersion, 50% linguistics. I should still be doing 100% immersion, but instead of, you know, some other strategies, swap them out and say, okay, look at the syntax of a Japanese sentence to understand, you know, concept A or concept B. It's immersion plus linguistics, not linguistics fitted into some previous thing. I'm not sure if that makes much sense, but my next tip kind of falls into that, and that is simply, Mark, if you want to test this theory, dig deeper into linguistics. Don't rely on what I currently know, because that's a very, very limited bank of knowledge, but go out of my way to actually learn syntax and the very specific linguistic functions of Japanese. Start that earlier. And to do that, and this is like tip number seven, have dedicated grammar learning blocks. Sure, you can watch anime, listen to music, uh, do Wani Kani and do Boon Pro, but have dedicated blocks where you say, okay, today I'm gonna get negation down. And lastly, number nine is to take more dedicated notes. I have been reading Take Kim's Grammar Guide, but it's simply been, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Acknowledgement of these rules. And I should be taking notes so that I can internalize that information uh, and be more mindful of it. It's, it's, it's a textbook. It's not a book that I should just be casually reading. It's kind of feels like it's in the middle, but all in all, I need to, you know, dedicate myself to it and not read it on the subway, which is how I got through a large portion of it this, these last two weeks. At last learning log, I said I would get down 103 kanji in relation to the JLPT N5. I would say I have about 85% of the kanji down solidly. There are like five or 10 that I remember my mnemonics for, but I'm like, ah, shoot, like what's the fourth and fifth meaning of this word? But that's just for meaning. And as I'll talk about the, the pronunciation and sound, I figure will come later. I kind of took some advice to heart and said, okay, focus on reading the meaning of it and fit it in to a sound later on. Because some of the pronunciations, as I have found out, are very, very rarely used. So in a moment, but not yet, we are going to jump into all of my progress clips from the last two weeks, which probably total to like 25 minutes of content, but I'm gonna shorten it uh, as much as I can. That's 97% for me to look back on in the future. So check the timestamps in the video bar right along here or in the description if it doesn't show up. Uh, and you can pretty much skip it because I will recap pretty much everything that I got from this kanji sprint. Okay, so I'm recording this quick clip. Uh, it is Sunday, August 15th, the day after the last learning log came up. I woke up and I went to check comments. I saw these ones and just thank you for these explicitly four comments. This one was also cool, but that's typing related. So thank you to these four people. Really appreciate these comments. 
I saw these and I was like, you know what? We're gonna do it. I'm gonna do it right now. Um, so I got an Anki deck called Pass JLPT N5. And if I go to browse and scroll down and see that it says new 104, which means there are, excuse me, 104 cards in this deck. When I first looked at this like three weeks ago, I was like, what? This is how you pronounce it? What are these? I need to look up how to use this. So I'm trying to Uno reverse this on myself, but are these all the ways to pronounce it? Okay, let me, hold on, let me. Dentia, wait, that's from the book. Electric car is train. Ah! <laughs> oh, it's right, it's literally right, it's literally right at the bottom. Then, okay, it's a work in progress, but yeah, whatever this clip is used for. I just did 10 kanji on Anki on an app. Obviously, uh, 10 out of 10 were all fails. Initial observations. This is still difficult. There are a few more things that make more sense than when I looked at this, say, like a week ago, which is very nice. Creating the visual mnemonics for things are okay. The difficulty is that some have so many definitions. I've been putting it off for a while and saying, I want to, you know, learn the underlying thing, uh, you know, what's happening behind the scenes. So now I've just come to say, I'm going to keep learning what's going on behind the scenes, but actually create the visual association with them for now. Um, so my goal, whoops, my goal is 103 in, I guess, two weeks. So a lot of Anki coming up. It's been a singular day. One day of kanji. I'm watching Anahana, Anohana, the flower we saw that day. First off, very feelsy. Second off, do you see this kanji here? No. Again, it's been one day. But that on the left, I don't know what the left radical is, but the two that are combined on the, the two thing, Mark, please circle this, mean go. And I remember that from the Anki thing, which is very cool. I saw it and I was like, I know that one. And then I was like, frick, no, I don't, because there's another radical there. Don't know how to freaking look them up. I can't find anything with stroke, rec stroke recognition. But anyway, back to the kanji grind once more, as I will be for the rest of my goddamn life. Found a cool website called Wanikani that's like teaches 2000 kanji in just over a year, which I think is fantastic, but I'm not doing that today. I just found the link and I wanted to mention it. it once again, <laughs> I'm going through more and more of the Anki deck and it's just, associating the image is good. That's definitely going to be, I'm going, definitely gonna be able to do it. I'm debating if I should try and memorize all the meanings associated with the kanji, which again can be done, but the problem is stroke order right now because I found that using an app called uh, Scripts where you kind of, it's like, it's drops, it's drops, but you practice writing it out. It's really helpful. So I need to find a resource that shows me the stroke order of kanji. Additionally, I'm also finding out that there's no avoiding learning both the onyomi and kunyomi. I've just gotten the word flower on my Anki thing and it's hana, or at least that's the kunyomi for it, so the Japanese pronunciation. <laughs> and I realized that the show I'm watching right now called Anohana, the flower we saw that day. I was like, oh, wait a minute. Ana plus Hana, the flower. Learning in context is super important and I'm gonna talk about this in the main body of this learning log and precisely because it takes less to memorize, less mental energy. You don't have to make up an arbitrary imagination of some guy. <laughs> I don't know, I'll talk about the, the whole mnemonic system when I go through all the 103 kanji, but that's it for now. Context is important. The importance of context. I was looking at my belt so I realized something. That last one, that last kanji, I looked at that one today. I saw that kanji today on, I just walked home, so I'm all sweaty. Do I remember what it means? No, I think it's pronounced Kai. Frank, but I recognized it. Memorization, a fun thing. The idea is not to say, oh, this kanji for rain looks like rain, so whenever I see it, I'll think of rain and then remember rain. That's the start, but it's not always gonna be like that. Over time, you will remove the middleman and the kanji will become implicit memorization. And that's really all I wanted to say. When it comes to learning vocab for any language, memorize it in a way that helps you remember the word. You can go too far, for example, using too much English, but as you keep using the word and you keep using this middleman of memorization, you will start to rely on it less. That's that, I'm, I'm reading another article on learning kanji about radicals because that seems important. I'm starting something called Wani Kani. I will be doing for the next year, it looks like. 
I think that's a very good plan to learn 2000 kanji. If you haven't heard of it, I'll leave a link in the description. I am still gunning for the first 103 of the JLPT or whatever the number is, JLPT N5 for the end of the month. And I, I'm thinking this will give me some good strategies, so. So I'll talk about this more when I summarize all this, but I'm watching ReZero. It occurred to me this morning that the the kanji on my belt is association, because that, that makes sense in the context of the belt. This episode is called The Witch's Tea Party, and technically association slash meetup works here. It's just contextualizing these things is so helpful. This is what I need to do because the the memorization itself kind of has to be done arbitrarily. You have to use SRS, space repetition, and all this stuff to do it. But when you, when you see it in use and you're like, oh yeah, then it, it starts to, you know, it starts to make sense. I don't really know how to explain it. It's more of an understanding thing, but you know, I'm starting to understand kanji on a subliminal level. Oh, look, it's me again. So something I found fascinating, I'm watching My Hero Academia. It comes out every Saturday. There's a character and his name is on screen, but it's written entirely in kanji, right? And so you, I can read the hiragana above it. I recognize technically two of them. One of them I know is a radical for, I think, a tree, uh, according to Wani Kani. Now, I've actually been wondering this because I know that names are represented with kanji. And so I need to look this up because uh, I also saw another show that was like outside of someone's house. It, it had kanji and then the hiragana to pronounce it. How you pick kanji and how the representations work for people's names. Because to me, right, Tomura Shigaraki means nothing. It's it's the same as John Smith. You know, John and Smith are arbitrary. The, the first kanji here is uh, shi, the second one is gira, and the third one is ki, and then the last one is tomura. And so maybe you know, like my name is Mark Bacon. Mark is arbitrary, but you could put it in the word bookmark. Bacon is technically arbitrary, but it also is the name of a food. So, uh, you know, I'm curious if over time I'll start to realize that these names have more meaning to them. I'm coming back from archery. And I was thinking a lot. Now I have a really busy week ahead. It's Monday. Uh, no, it's not. It's Tuesday. It's Tuesday morning. Kanji have different pronunciations, right? So, in theory, so does. The English alphabet. What's what I love so much about the hiragana and katakana is that there's no ambiguity between what sound is what. Like there are specific characters when there's double consonants and whatever, or elongated sounds. But kanji have multiple sounds. But then again, so does the English alphabet. A can be pronounced a ah ah. I think what I'm gonna do now is taking from one ikani essentially, focusing on a the meaning of the kanji and just onyomi kunyomi, one of each reading. And if I get those, I'll check it off, because with context will come the different pronunciations and various meanings, so. Yeah. All right, so it is Thursday today. I have been grinding delete code this week. I finished level one on, that exposure's never gonna work, but I finished level one on Wani Kani, so very exciting. That's my mess, don't worry about it. Looking at the kanji on Wani Kani, because I just unlocked level two, uh, a lot of the upcoming ones are JLPT N5 related kanji. To go out, exit, come, uh, earth, ground, soil, thousand, student, few, little, wow, I'm remembering a lot of these. Center, Oroku, five, Ichini, Sanchi, go, no, that's six, my bad. Uh, go, five, water, Mizu, fire, don't remember, uh, Hidari and Migi. Just, wow, I'm actually a little, little proud of myself that I'm recognizing all these. It'll be cool to see what pronunciation Wani Kani has you remember too. <sighs> Nothing but Lee Code and Kanji this week. That's pretty much it. <laughs> once more, I'm back from boxing and my brain has made another observation. On my belt, once more. The name of our style is on the belt. Now, I've deduced this last one is Kai, which means association. And the, the first one, thanks to Wani Kani, I now know is above. But above is pronounced Ue. Right? And the style starts with Wei. So if Wei Chi Ru Butoku Kai, I know Wei and I know Kai. So now I just have to figure out what Chi Ru Butoku translates to. And if you know, please don't tell me. I figured it wasn't going to translate to anything, honestly. And it just was its own thing. Kind of like karate isn't translated, it's just karate. But anyway. Observations continue. Uh, I finished ReZero last episode before I get to my leak code grind. But anyway, something to observe here. Kanji for moon, right, I recognize it. Then there's to, and then there's the kanji for exit, followed by a kanji that contains the kanji for fish, which from my understanding means that it's a whole different meaning. And there's I, 
and then some other sounds. Super cool. Uh, and I think that this, with vocab, exemplifies what I think is best about immersion, is that when you learn new words, you get to see it in use. When you learn new grammar, immersion is when you start to contextualize it all. And I think that as adults, when we, you know, learn the semantics of a language or what tenses mean, when we hear them, we can more easily categorize them, I guess, as opposed to simply just for getting used to it over enough time. Very oversimplified explanation. My brain's kind of not present, but yeah, it's just cool to notice that. My room is a mess right now, but a uh, real quick update for learning long. This is Boon Pro. I mean, you can't see me, so I'm gonna switch back in just a second, but uh, expressing state of being, introduction to particles, adjectives, whatever. I'll talk more about this when I get to take his grammar guide in the, in the actual video, which I need to record today and upload and edit it. <laughs> what is really helpful about Wani Kani is that it's an automated system so that I can check in and they just give me what I need to do, right? Going through Boon Pro, I know what particles are now. I know what adjectives are. I know what verbs are. I can tell you a lot about intransitive versus transitive and ditransitive verbs. Clauses and sentence order, particles, adverbs and sentence ending. It's all pretty good. Anyway, I just wanted to say something about Boon Pro. All right, so kanji recap, pretty much gonna be reading straight from this list of main observations. So from those clips that I've just compiled, what were my biggest observations, the most helpful things in learning kanji? Thing number one, and I'm gonna lose count quite quickly if we're being honest, the importance of fitting kanji into context. Some of the kanji I got like that, quite literally, because I could immediately contextualize them. I've been watching a show called Anohana, The Flower That Day. I have two episodes left. I'm probably gonna cry at the end. Hana means flower. So when I saw the kanji for flower, I created a memory mnemonic, which I've become very good at over the past few years. The image and the meaning come to mind very easily, but the sound is more difficult. The thing is, I can now associate Hana with Anohana, the name of the show. So meaning was easy, pronunciation is another thing entirely. The first step of progress, and I think this is something I would definitely give advice to people, is to say that like the first level of learning kanji is simply to recognize it. I live in New York City, so I've been seeing Mandarin Chinese everywhere and even some Japanese on some streets that are like all Japanese restaurants. I can look at kanji uh, and hiragana and katakana and be like, oh, hey, that's a kanji. And you know, I've seen that radical before uh, and all that fun stuff. That's level one of learning a kanji in, in my experience now, I guess, in my opinion. And going forward, my first step is gonna be, can I, you know, do I recognize this? Have I seen this before? What's its meaning? What's its sound? And you know, so on and so forth. Kanji is a long game. This is no surprise and it should not be a surprise to you, but a common thing in language learning is to learn 20% of the language uh, and you will be able to speak 80% of it. In French, I'm considered business proficient, but when I started to read The Witcher, I couldn't get through the first page because I didn't understand half the words there. My conversational skills are good. It's the vocab that's niche. So as I mentioned earlier with kanji, you know, outside of this like JLPT sprint, the only things I'm gonna make kanji for are ones that come up in these light novels or just, you know, rely entirely on Wani Kani. Next thing is just doing this memorization sprint that I did this last two weeks is not something I would, rec uh, would recommend unless you're cramming for the JLPT or something. Half was to say to myself, this is how I'm gonna learn kanji, but then I discovered Wani Kani. And half was just to say, you know, how are my memory systems that I, developed slash read about in, you know, at the start of my high school career when I started doing like this memory stuff of, you know, memory palace, peg system, linked lists, all that stuff. I'm still pretty good at it. And it was kind of fun to, you know, get back into it. Immersion is a fantastic way to give things meaning. I just mentioned this with uh, contextualization. And that's kind of what I mean. Taking vocab here and expanding it to this, this theory that I have. When we learn a grammatical concept, if we become very conscious of it, for example, uh, wa indicates a very strong topic of a sentence. Watashi wa. Wa me is saying, as for me, watashi. Watashi wa maku desu. And that, you know, that would only be said if I was going down the line and saying, that's Nick, that's Joe, that's Sam. As for me, I am Mark, I believe. When we, he when we learn these things, wa versus ga, then we can start to hear them and that in my opinion, and I, because of the lack of depth I've been going into grammar on, uh, I have yet to really experience this, but I have noticed it with very simple things. So as we learn these things, immersion contextualizes it. I really, really don't think you should rely on just listening to so much Japanese that you'll recognize the pattern. Chances are you can get there. But I think as adults, we should make use of this cognitive function that we have 
nonetheless, reading, watching TV, listening is incredibly important. <laughs> you can't get away with it. It's not like you can just read a textbook and be fine. And as I talked about in the last learning log, practice. Coming up on the end of this mini list here, as with anything, I can tell you all of this, but no idea can truly be communicated. And so the biggest tip that I can give to you is just get started. Wani Kani is free for the first five levels. And depending on what pace you take that, that'll take you a month and a bit to get there. And just get started because as you go, you will start to make realizations on your own. Three weeks ago, before I had looked at like any kanji, I was clueless on is there a pattern with the radicals for the sound to the meaning? How do I know which meaning is used when? Which, totally clueless. And I've read, I almost want to say dozens, I've probably read 15 to 20 articles about kanji. And it was great knowledge, but it was only understood when I went out and started Wani Kani, saw the kanji on my belt, heard things said in a TV show. When you make these realizations on your own, you internalize them and then things will make more sense. And lastly, one thing that I've been very annoyed with is that because I've been doing the JLPT and five kanji on my own, my mnemonics with Wani Kani conflict. <laughs> For the radical that looks like this, I call it needle, because to me it looks like a needle going into someone's arm. They call it narwhal. <laughs> so it'll come up and I'll be like, ah, frick, what was Wani Kani's mnemonic? So yeah, that's, you know, a summary of my kanji recap. Take from that what you will. With the grammar guide, I mentioned this earlier, but I've been reading it, but not deeply internalizing it. Boon Pro and Wani Kani are seemingly wonderful resources. So really quick, this is Wani Kani. It's honestly, it's fantastic. It's a great thing to do uh, using space repetition. I have 39 reviews right now. I had like 49 yesterday. I just sit down morning, afternoon, evening, sometimes twice in the evening, uh, sometimes twice in the morning, and I just do whatever reviews I have. And then the lessons I chip away at like four or five at a time. So I usually finish a lesson in like two or three days and I'm only level two. This is a resource I will continue to use going forward. Some people have completed it in just under slash just over a year and I'm gonna shoot for that. So, you know, maybe 18 months on the 2000 kanji and 6,000 ish vocab. Well, no. Anyway, the other thing is Boon Pro, which is kind of a similar, now I literally just started yesterday. I said I was using Tay Kim's grammar guide and boom. You can go through and you can do grammar over and over again. And now what I like about these two systems importantly is that a it keeps me you know if i'm thinking i need to do japanese i there's no excuse to say i don't know what to do it's look at boom pro or go to wani kani on the side i will keep looking at things like syntax and using this jlpt n5 study book i have because i will be signing up for the jlpt n5 in december assuming i can make it before the site crashes or seats fill up anyway going forward those will be two of my main tools to sit down and work on those very concretely and also, you know, this leaves the quote unquote basic Japanese learning to these websites and tools. And I can go do my own thing, knowing that I will progress here, which is kind of nice. Will this work for me in another month? Come back in a month and find out. I'll talk about that in just a moment. I'm gonna go, you know, read about Japanese syntax, Japanese morphology, Japanese phonology, all that fun stuff that I surprisingly really enjoyed reading about and see if I can apply it and have it accelerate my learning or at least deepen my learning. So seeing as this is the last learning log for the summer, I have kind of surprisingly to myself, really committed to Japanese. I am full in on this. Russian, I stopped. Spanish and Italian was a month long experiment that I didn't really go through. Japanese was going to be another three month sprint and see if I like it or not. But like two months ago, I was like, no, I'm fully in this. So these learning logs will continue and they will be every second Saturday of the month, as opposed to every two weeks, it'll just be every four weeks. Learning logs will no longer have a, you know, half talk about linguistics, other half be my progress. It'll just be reflections in progress. I would say like 40% of these learning logs are for me in the future to look back on and laugh at myself or be like, ah, yes, I, I came a long way. The other half is to maybe motivate anyone else. I got a comment from someone saying, these motivated them to keep learning Korean. And like, that's great. I didn't even expect that to happen. The the best thing I thought would happen would be someone stumbles across these and says, oh, that'll help me for learning Japanese or whatever. The fact that they're actually helping people, people are actually coming to these videos is awesome. So I'm gonna be keeping them up. My goals going forward as I end every learning log are taking the JLPT N5 in December. Oh, got this bad boy. I think I'll definitely be able to do it. Will I be at a very solid level? I really don't know. I have not looked into the requirements that much, but I definitely think I can make it. 
um, especially N5. N5 and N4, from what I understand, are meant for like basic comprehension. It's N2 and N1 that are the incredibly difficult ones and not, you know, the, the gap from N5 to N4, from what I understand, please correct me if I'm wrong, is going to be smaller, significantly smaller than the gap from N3 to N2. Actually read these. Now that I am learning grammar, I will just redundantly read the short stories over and over again. Practice hiragana, katakana, look at kanji, learn new kanji through it. You know, kanji are combined. What new words can I learn from that? Grammar on Boon Pro and what I'm reading in Take Kim's Grammar Guide. Where do those show up? Where can I identify them? Build syntax trees from Japanese sentences, which to me is like weirdly fun. Um, but anyway, Wanikani and Boon Pro, I will be continuing these daily. I feel committed to Japanese and it feels like a no-brainer to be like, yeah, no, I'll do these every day, which doesn't really say much, but to me says everything. Um, and that's, you know, one of those things that I just understand about myself. I might fail still, but compared to other things, it feels very concrete. Full notes on Take Kim's Grammar Guide. So I'm actually going to start again and start taking actual notes because the vocab he uses is, you know, comes up a lot, but also reading it on a Kindle is probably more ineffective with it being so small. When I schedule in my projects, I have to cut down seeing as I have classes, but Japanese is gonna be one of those. So I want to make full on Japanese like learning blocks and actually stick to them this time for like an hour and a half, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or something like that. And lastly, uh, turning my phone and such into Japanese, uh, joining Japanese discords, watching a little more Japanese YouTube. I don't really watch much YouTube these days anymore. If I do, watch Japanese YouTube. Anyway, the longest learning log by far. So if you've stuck it out to the end, thank you so much. I do really, really appreciate it. Um, I hope you did get something from this learning log, from this little mini series in general. More will be coming. Let me know what you think. If you haven't already, subscribe down below. Like, what languages are you learning? Fun stuff like that. Something I've been realizing lately is that comments, when people engage with the content on a really deep level, whether it be really thoughtful comments of critique or, you know, encouragement, it's really cool that people are actually watching these videos now. So thank you so much. I, I really do uh, appreciate it. And I know those, you know, it's weird being the person to say this. I'm going to stop recording, take a breather, grind this video out, and hopefully get it out by this evening. So thank you yet again. Have a good one, and as always, don't forget to stay awesome. And if I don't see you in tomorrow's video, I will see you in two weeks.